we are moving in yet again a totally different direction uh, with a digital readiness survey with our members Anne, August, Emma, and Olivia. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Anne. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve at Neighborhood House. My name is Emma. I also use she, her pronouns, and I serve at Emerge. Hi, my name is Olivia. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve at Hired at the East Side location. Hello, my name is August. I use he, him pronouns, and I serve at Hired, the Brooklyn Park location. And without further ado, we'll go ahead and dive right in. So for our civic engagement project, we wanted to study this concept that is known as digital readiness. The definition you can see right there in the top bullet point, it's the comfort and ability in using digital technologies to accomplish specific tasks. This is really one step beyond access. So we already know there's been a lot of great research that shows there's a wide disparity that exists between who has access to technologies and who doesn't. So we really wanted to look at once you have technology, how comfortable do you feel using it and how able are you to use it? In 2012, the city of Minneapolis released a survey that found that only 51% of adults felt very comfortable searching and applying for jobs online. This was a really interesting piece of data and was one of the catalyzing pieces of data behind this project. We wanted to see how has this changed over the past decade. So in order to study this concept, we decided to build a a survey um, of participants at CTEP partner organizations. We wanted to pinpoint community needs as they're presently felt. And then in the culmination of our project, we'll be distributing our findings, which we hope can influence future programming at our service sites. Uh, getting a little bit into the actual logistics of the survey, um, our survey had a couple different sections. It started off with questions about uh, comfort with different performing different tasks on the computer, um, and also the frequency with which people performed those tasks. Um, we asked people how they got uh, help when they had computer problems. We had a couple kind of key questions about um, using technology in the job search because um, uh, CTIP has a focus on um, like career preparation and helping people in the job search. Job search. And then we also finished by asking um, about interest in different types of computer trainings. Uh, we gathered some standard demographic info and then we allowed people to um, optionally opt in to uh, raffle for a $20 Target gift card. So in creating the survey, we really wanted to make sure that it was accessible on a mobile device. Um, so we decided to use uh, Google Forms to create the actual survey. And we received a lot of feedback throughout the process of creating the survey itself. Um, Dan Bachman at the University of Minnesota was our um, survey consultant, so thank you to him. Um, we also got feedback from Joel and Lizzie, um, from the supervisors at our sites, from Pelosi Teps, and then we were able to take uh, drafts of the survey on kind of test runs with participants at our site, so that was also really helpful as well. And then these are our eight um, partner sites. Uh, Unfortunately, because of the pandemic, we weren't able to distribute the survey um, in person. So uh, distribution of the survey in partnership with these sites is completely digital. Um, most of uh, the people we reached just through uh, mass emails. And then some of, um, some of our participants also filled out the survey during CTEP led like classes and trainings. Okay, so now moving into some of our results. We can start with taking a look at a few of the demographic components. So as you can see by this chart, we had about 36% of our respondents reporting to making more than $50,000 on an annual basis. This was a little bit higher than we um, anticipated, which was kind of interesting. Um, but if you can see over here in the blue and red sections, we also had 24% making between 15 and 30,000 and then 24% making less than 15,000. So about half of our respondents were pretty low income earners. In terms of race and ethnicity, about a little bit over a half responded to being Caucasian, about 25% said they were African-American, and then we had smaller percentages of Latinx, Hispanic, Native American, Asian, and then other and unknown. Uh, we had a fairly educated um, pool of respondents. A little bit over half of our respondents had a college degree. And then um, as you can see, more than three quarters of our respondents had completed um, some college coursework. And then finally, um, our 
biggest pool, about 35% um, of our respondents were employed full time. Um, and as you can see, the rest of our respondents were a big mix of different employment statuses. Um, this makes sense because actually the majority of our respondents um, were connected to us through Hired, which is a nonprofit that focuses on people in moments of career, uh, career transition and like job search. So an important part of the survey was figuring out how often people use technology in daily life and what that usage looks like and what their skill level looks like. Um, so we really wanted to get at how reliant are people um, on technology. And we found that actually a lot of our respondents um, work from home pretty frequently. Over 200 of them said they work from home daily and 40 of them work from home weekly. Um, and similarly, over 140 respondents said they attend online meetings on a daily basis, and over 100 said they attend them on a weekly basis. Um, and we really attributed this to um, the COVID-19 pandemic that's been happening for the last almost year and a half, and um, just realizing that that has really impacted the way that people um, now live on a digital platform. Another thing we looked at is how frequently respondents do certain activities. And we found that for the activities we mapped, you can, it's a little bit small, but you can see there's anything from using email to getting health or medical information to downloading applications from the internet. Um, we found that people overall um, did things pretty frequently um, and there were very few like nevers. So very few respondents who said, I've never done this task. Um, so those results were not very surprising. We found that, um, based on our frequency map, it seems like people are using technology on a daily basis. And one of our most interesting findings was that 82% of our respondents um, said they were comfortable applying to and searching for jobs online. Um, and you might, remember, you might remember earlier in this presentation, August mentioned the 2012 survey that the city of Minneapolis ran that said just about 50% of people were respondents saying they were comfortable applying to and searching to, for jobs online. Um, so this was really surprising. Um, take it with a grain of salt, we only had 406 respondents, um, which is a much smaller sample size uh, than the city of Minneapolis' survey in 2012. Um, but we were still really surprised and somewhat encouraged by this finding. Um, but we were also thinking that these are people self-reporting, saying they're comfortable applying to jobs online. And there's a difference between applying to a job online and actually getting one of those jobs that you apply to online, uh, which I think is really where CTEP comes in. And not just that you know how to do this, but you know how to do this skill well and you know can eventually get employment from an online job application. So now we're going to shift over to talk more about interest in training and um, being contacted by a computer instructor. So when we asked, would you like to be contacted by a computer teacher? About 40% of the respondents said yes. And if you think about it, that is a decent number of people. It's about 150 people who are interested in working on computer skills. So this is showing that around community centers, there's a strong interest in getting in contact with instructors. It does not specify in this point right here what kind of trainings people are interested in, but we're going to take a look at that in a moment here. So one dynamic that we were taking a look at here was interest in computer training and how that compares to income. So I know it's kind of small, but you can see with people who have an income less of less than 15,000, 52% indicated, yes, they were interested in computer training. The next group, 15,000 to 30,000, 69% indicated yes. And then we start seeing a decrease here with 30,000 to 50,000, only 39% indicated yes. Mind you, that's still a pretty big number there. And then finally, looking at those who make more than $50,000, you can see that only about 19% said yes, they were interested. So it is, um, I think it's interesting, I know I just said that, to keep looking at how interest in training decreased as income increased. And I think that makes sense considering that if you are lower income, it's harder to get access to technology and other tools. So that does make sense. Um, and then also just thinking about how people's income may have shifted as well as a result of COVID-19. So maybe those numbers don't reflect pre-COVID numbers is what I'm saying. <laughs> 
And so next I'm going to touch on the training subjects that had the most interest. So the one with the most interest here is about protecting yourself and your data online. 42% said they were very interested in this subject and 30% said possibly interested. So that is a lot of people who are interested in learning about this subject. Um, and this may have been a result of just the huge increase of technology distribution among community members. It shows a need within communities to be educated on this subject even further. Um, and it's also good to note that sometimes people may be set up with a computer, but maybe don't have the knowledge or skills to protect themselves online. So it may potentially indicate that people have had bad experiences, but they're also more self-aware of what they need to work on as they are using this technology. And then the subject with the second most interest was troubleshooting with computer hardware or mobile devices. So again, with very interested and possibly interested, both of them were at 32%. So again, high interest. Um, and this may just show here that their people want additional help when it comes to troubleshooting for their technology. So these two subjects hopefully can influence uh, future programming or an increase in that kind of programming among community centers. But overall, we can see with this survey that there is a huge interest in people continuing to work on their computer skills. So with all that being said, do you have any questions for us? I was so impressed that you got 400 responses on this. Like I never would have dreamed that level. I would have like been pretty happy with 100. <laughs> I think in this virtual environment and just how hard it is to connect with people and uh, right now. Um, so that is a huge, incredible achievement of this program. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll mention, I know the members have heard me talk about this before, but the, this, the results of this are going to be hugely important for our AmeriCorps program and just how, um, and so many of our program partners and how we make the case for why what we do is important for the community. Um, and, you know, for AmeriCorps, like we have to make the case for funding, you know, there is a lot of national data about the need for technology literacy skills, and there is not a lot of local data. Uh, out there. So it's really hard to find like, you know, like why should, why should CTEP belong in the Twin Cities versus Chicago or Mel like what, what is the need like specifically here? So um, I think um, especially that one about 40% of people wanting like insistent, uh, like assistance from an actual person. I mean, I hear that all the, all the time about uh, like, well, why can't people just learn these skills through watching YouTube videos or, um, online support and you know, like it's clear that there's like a big part of the population that really prefers to learn like from other like <laughs> humans like that's either not the way they learn or like that's not um like there's too many barriers to learning that way or like you know so many other reasons so um great uh let me see what we have down here okay so teresa asked uh what surprised you most and least about the data collect you collected so you touched on that a little bit, but was there were there were there other things you kind of haven't mentioned that you're like, well, I didn't I didn't expect. You kind of mentioned the demographics a little bit that more it was a little bit higher income that you mentioned. You were surprised about uh, how many people did feel comfortable looking for a job. Like, what what else did you want to say about this? I think something that surprised me overall was like people throughout the survey said like I'm really comfortable using technology. These are the activities I do all the time. I feel comfortable doing almost every task we had, but then we still had 40% of people say they wanted help. Um, so it was interesting. I mean, there wasn't really room in our survey for nuance saying like, okay, maybe these skills are all like really easy for them and they want help on more, um, you know, advanced skills, or maybe they're like, oh, I can kind of do them. But um, not well enough, or I don't know. That that was just interesting for me, and I wish we would have had more time to get into that more. I think too the uh, just the the high demand for data protection uh, training was interesting and kind of surprising. I know that like at my uh, site we don't offer that a lot, like in our current programming. So after doing this uh, survey, 
I think I would recommend like looking into how we can incorporate that in the future. So that was a nice yeah. takeaway. We had Martha ask from Hennepin County Library, uh, thanks for including the Minneapolis Central Library as a service site. This is so useful. What do you think could be done in the future to mitigate possible selection bias? Would a shorter or less complex survey garner responses for more users with low computer skills? Maybe the survey could be mediated somehow or use a different method like structured interviews or focus groups. This is a really good question. Um, I think something we struggled with for a really long time was wanting to have the survey available in different languages. And I think um, that probably could have mitigated a lot of our selection bias. I know I work at a site where a lot of participants don't speak English. So a lot of participants at my site were not able to take the survey. Um, unfortunately, we just like didn't have the resources to be able to translate it into different languages. Um, but that's something that comes to mind immediately for me. Um, something we also talked about um, kind of early on when we were thinking about the project was we were hoping to be able to kind of like table at our sites or at community events or something like that, um, where we could be like physically there asking people they wanted to participate. Um, so that could be um, like looking towards the future if a similar survey was conducted um, in a different year, that could hopefully be a way to kind of mitigate that and make sure that you're really reaching a, a broad swath of um, participants at a particular site. Um, and to add to that as well, we originally did want to collect qualitative data through interviewing people, but um, we did not have the capacity within our time frame to be able to do that. So that would definitely, if someone were to do this again, would be good information to get about people's feelings um, about digital readiness. Yeah, Martha, I loved your question because my, my memory with the, the city survey in 2012, I think they just mailed out 50,000 surveys to people. So like there was no technology skills you had to even have to complete the survey. So I mean, I think that could be a little bit of a reason why we're seeing that discrepancy between um, like the 50 and the 80% uh, with this. So yeah, I think you just have to keep trying to get information in different ways. And um, I think I know that some of your sites got really into this. And I'm really, I think some of your sites like bought into like, oh, this is important to try to gather this kind of information from our learners. So I know like Emerge and Hired and I am, I think is a lot of potential for those organizations that can continue to try to collect this kind of information in the future. So I think you really paved a way for a lot of these organizations to kind of run with this and kind of go in their own directions uh, in the future. So way to go.